You are listening to the SDSU Football Podcast, presented by the East Village Times with your hosts, Andre Hagverdian and Paul Garrison. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of the SDSU Football Podcast. I am your host, Andre Hagverdian, and joined, as always, by my co-host, Paul Garrison. Today, we will be providing you the special interview we had with special teams coordinator Doug Deacon at San Diego State as we went through and discussed the special teams unit that he oversees um, as uh, San Diego State heads into the fall camp. Obviously, that includes uh, the field goal kickers, the punters, snappers, kick returners, and also the the other guys on the special teams that you don't usually talk about or hear about that are doing the blocking, the nitty gritty stuff when it comes to special teams. So definitely hope you guys will enjoy that conversation as as much as Paul and I did, uh, because it was a lot of de- great details about how the special teams units are being formed uh, heading into fall camp. Take a listen and hope you guys will enjoy it. We want to welcome Coach Doug Deacon back on the SDSU Football Podcast. How are you doing today, Coach? I'm great. How are you guys? Well, thank you. Great as well. 54 Um, days away from the 100th season. Here we go. Exciting times on the Mesa for sure. We spoke to you, obviously, I think around spring camp. So, you know, a a lot has happened since then. So we want to just get a better understanding of where the special teams unit look uh, as we head into fall camp. You know, obviously, after last year, you know, Matt Ariza was uh, got a lot of accolades, a lot of recognition He for doing both roles, uh, field goal and punting. As the year went on, it was clear he was a good field goal kicker, but a great punter. Uh, Jack Browning is listed as a starting punter and field goal kicker. At this stage, is there one role he is better at than the other? Yeah, I'd say punting, he's ahead of uh, his field goal uh, and kickoff. Did a nice job in spring. However, we need to add more competition to the room because in spring ball, uh, all three, uh, Delgado, Hopkins, and um, Jack were right around 70 percentile. And that took that was the duration of 15 practices and live reps with the team. Um, and that's not good enough. So um, there's things to be worked on here this summer and then into fall camp for solidifying who really is our number one field goal kicker. Yeah, that was our, the next question is going to be about because you told us earlier in the year that your ideal uh, scenario would be to have one person for each role. So it's fair to say that the field goal competition is still up for grabs between those three gentlemen. Yes, and that'll be decided in fall camp. Obviously, you want to add as much of a game feel to it. Um, we'll do a full period of PAT field goals, so they'll each get about three to four kicks. And then if there's any any scrimmage portion of practice uh, or team periods, uh, when those um, opportunities present themselves to perform. Um, And just, I mean, to clarify, so, so Jack is competing at both. Is, is there a chance that he could lose at both positions? Sure. Uh, Best guy's going to win. This is, uh, you know, in in doing an interview and getting asked this, uh, I'm fired up because there's an interest in it and, um, obviously, he's got all the specialists and anyone on the team that plays on special teams has everything to do with our success. But one of the biggest things in playing for Coach Oak and being on his staff, this program is built on competition. So it um, doesn't matter if you're a scholarship athlete, doesn't matter if you're a walk-on athlete, um, if you know what to do and how to do it and uh, can do it in, in team setting and in the game, then you're for sure getting your shot. So in spring, you told us that uh, David Delgado was held back a little bit, um, monitoring his kicks, that sort of things. Could you uh, just give us an update on his status and and where he is at in that recovery process? Yeah, you know, he recovered a lot. He was a lot further along than I would have thought he'd be. And the best part about David Delgado is how hard he works you know, it's almost one of those things where you try to pull the rein him in and pull him back from doing too much or overexerting. 
Um, so he did a, a nice job of, in terms of toughness and working with the trainers and, and being further along than what I initially thought of where he might be at. And uh, he's improved his kick trajectory from the moment it leaves the ground there to climbing so that balls aren't getting blocked at the line of scrimmage, uh, let alone where it's going through the goalposts. Uh, was a much improved from last season. And uh, he's also done a good job of working on punting as well, uh, kind of rounding out his his abilities and, and ways he can help this football team and uh, was pleased uh, with his spring practice. However, as I mentioned, we weren't above 80 percent. And that lends me to tell you guys that the, the job's open and it needs to be won uh, sooner than later here in fall camp or we'll go to find whoever that best guy is. Um, multiple people have gone out of their way to praise uh, David Delgado for the person and the teammate that he is. Uh, he's an upperclassman. Uh, he's been with the program the longest among the specialists. What does he bring in terms of leadership to the group? A tremendous passion and enthusiasm uh, for his teammates and for uh, the game of football, and he is so beloved because he he genuinely cares. I mean, he he didn't get us. He did help hold uh, for field goal in the Boise State game, um, but other than that, did not have a kick attempt. But he was just as into it as a starter. Uh, you would believe to be on game day. Um, those are the kinds of things that you know just. You notice as a coach and you know, as obviously his peers and his teammates recognize that and uh, in any of the workouts, he he's held accountable and holds the other guys accountable to doing their very best. And I think that's what ultimately all the guys respect and, and see from him on a daily basis. Uh, Jack Browning is also an upperclassman. How is he handling that leadership role now? He is doing a great job. And I was about to come out with a couple more superlatives, but all will be said here when we come to fall camp, he's putting himself in tremendous position to really have a great debut and show Aztec Nation and uh, obviously compete to win the jobs. And I say that to say he's done a great job in the strength and conditioning program that the team runs. He is running with the skill guys. Uh, in the weight room, you know, he's he's doing a tremendous job of taking care of his body and he's uh, seemingly much more flexible. He's always been flexible, but things to where as a coach and observing and watching him uh, prepare for the season, he's doing all the things as if he was a veteran guy um, that has been the starter for years and why I'm really excited about what he can bring to the team here in our 100th season. You know, piggybacking a little bit with uh, David Delgado, um, one thing that that I thought was pretty classy is in one of the practices that I went to, when he first came out on the field, he made his way to our photographer and he thanked him because he said, you know, photographers, we don't always get our pictures taken, but the fact that you're doing that, just want to tell you how much we appreciate that, you know, and I thought that was really classy of him. But with all of the coaches that we've spoken to, they talk about, you know, the time at the end of spring to the beginning of fall camp as as you know, the time where players really make their biggest strides. Um, is, is that the same for the specialists? Absolutely. And that's why I was kind of tongue tied there and, you know, talking about Jack, but you can see it. Bodies are transforming uh, at the weight room session this morning at 6 a.m. I'm going up and down the weight room as Coach Hall's taking him through the workout. I'm going, wow, is that a bicep? You didn't have that last <laughs> year. And, and hey, is that a neck? <laughs> You're filling out your T-shirt and guys that are front squatting 225 is their warm up that couldn't do 225 six months ago. Um, those sort of strength gains you see. And most importantly, you, you see everyone sweating together. Everyone's suffering and pushing and, and moving on. And that's really where, in my opinion, uh, great bond, a team bond uh, is formed in these months uh, prior to fall camp. And uh, it was great to see the guys get after it this morning. And I do believe for specialists, it's critical because this is where you're really honing in on your technique. Yes, there's strength gains to be had, flexibility, taking care of your body, um, where because come season time, you're not going to be lifting legs the same way you are in these two summer months. Um, so it's a very important time for a specialist. And then the technique wise out on the field work, you should be ironing out 
your approach, your, your steps, those sort of things, so that when it is time to compete, time to show you garner the first team reps, that it isn't, you know, the rust is off. Uh, we've, we've done that here this summer before fall camp. The last time we spoke, you left us with a tantalizing nugget of information. You said that Colin Hopkins had his best day as an Aztec um, that same day that we spoke with you. Uh, and if he could kick like that every day, he could really elevate himself in the competition. How did the end of um, tail end of camp go for him? And, and what have you seen from him this summer? He's right on track to uh, athletically on why we recruited him and why he's an Aztec. Unfortunately, he's uh, chosen the engineering uh, major here at San Diego State, and that is as tough a program um, as it should be. Um, and unfortunately, he's not on the team for this uh, upcoming season uh, with academic requirements. So unfortunately, we are without Colin. Um, but to answer your question, I mean, he was progressing, and here he was uh, one year into the program, graduating high school early to join in spring of last year um, and, and making all the, the appropriate steps to being a great specialist. So as soon as he can take care of the academic uh, portion of it, we'll, we'll, we'll see once that happens. Jared Reeser, uh, he's a transfer kick who, kicker who was a walk-on at Michigan State and is walking on at San Diego State, joined the program after spring. What can you tell us about him, and does he have a chance to insert himself in the competition? Absolutely. We wouldn't have. Uh, once he went into the transfer portal, I would have recruited him out of high school. He went to Canyon High School in Santa Clarita. Tremendous soccer player. So tell me if that sounds familiar. Uh, went overseas to play in Italy, scored 81 goals in a season. Um, picked up football, much like Matt, not until high school and even later, I want to say his sophomore year, um, going and kicking for um, the football team. The reason we didn't bring him on then is because no one could have told me that Matt Ariza was going to declare for the NFL draft going into last season. Jarrett was yeah. in the class of 21. Um, so we were not in the market for a field goal kicker kickoff. He also punted tremendously well. I believe he was second in California after the 2020 or the modified COVID-21 season. And so he brings tremendous uh, athleticism. He brings tremendous leg power. The ball off his foot sounds just like Matt Ariza's. And I say that because I was out on the road recruiting and putting a sound clip. He showed me some of his, his kicking on his own and my car stereo was turned up significantly. And as my phone was plugged in, the thump and the bass in the car rattled the car. And I went, that sounds good. And I go, <laughs> let me, let me, let me compare it here. And of course, on my iPhone, I had a a picture clip or a, a video clip of Matt kicking, you know, a couple summers ago, and it sounded very similar. So wow. very excited about him. And, um, and of course he's coming here to compete. He's not coming here to red shirt. And, you know, if that's what it has to take, then yeah, that he didn't win the job, but he's coming here to compete for the job and jobs. Was he on his way here already, even before the Colin Hopkins um, academic issues? Uh, yes, he was being okay. once he hit the transfer portal. Um, that's when I reached out to him, asked him, you know, where what he, what was going on, and you know where where he was looking to go, and all those sort of things. And he was being recruited specifically to help us in the field goal department. But he can also kick off, and he can also punt. So again, kind of as you get to know me and, and interviewing, uh, those are the metrics you kind of the boxes you want checked at least I do in terms of a specialist, a guy that's well-rounded. It does take a little bit away from each if you're doing all three at the same time. However, the guys that are athletic enough to do it and have the prowess to do it significantly add value to your program. Are, are there any nuances um, that you look for in a punter or a field goal kicker that might go unnoticed to the, the, the average fan? That's a great question. Uh, for a punter, it's his hands. 
the whole play yeah. is predicated on him catching the snap. And then we talk about, and you would know as a, as a fan and, and someone that covers football and watches football intently, it's operation time. At least that's coach speak. You always hear mm-hmm. about, oh, operation time. Well, if he doesn't have great hands, the punter, then there goes the operation time. And you could have the greatest leg in, in all of football, which Matt Ariza uh, approved last year. And that was his, that's what was holding him back. Not that he would drop the ball, but just how you catch it and operate with it. In terms of field goal kicking, not common to the eye. Um, I think it's a lot to do with uh, rhythm. And I think it has a lot to do with great balance um, guys. Everyone has a different approach to the ball, but in, in kind of articulating something that maybe you don't watch or, or notice um, the real successful guys make it look so easy, don't they? And one of my common denominators is just their balance in their steps to the ball and then the explosion through the ball and how they finish. So those are a lot of things I'm watching when you watch guys film for a punter, it's his hands. And then the ball will tell you, you know, leg strength. Did it go beyond 40 yards? Well, that guy's got a great leg. You know, he's got strength. Um, But for field goal, I'd say, you know, great balance. To finish that point, it's how they finish the kick a lot of times is what I'm referring to in the balance portion. If they're out of control after they hit the ball, you're just increasing the, the likelihood for margin for error. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've talked a lot about, and Coach Hoke has about competition just throughout the program, and that's no different in special teams. What what does continuing to add to that mix, uh, why does that make everyone better? Because you know that you have to perform at your best or else the next guy's up. You know, the guy that you're competing with just, you know, you're going toe-to-toe with the guy, and last thing you want to do as a competitor is lose and the pride uh, factor of it and the let alone just – Here's the expectation. I can't get away with missing the field goal because the next guy just swished. And now as a coach, you know, as a player and as a coach, like, well, the guy who makes the field goal is going to get the opportunity to play. So it adds that element to it. And, you know, there's just that element where it isn't competition time that I really need to take care of my body because I want to be at my best every day because we will have three field goals and I won't, and I'm going to go one, I'm trying to go one for one each time. Talk, taking us through a little bit of the competition, um, you know, coach um, Cooper, when we talked to him, he mentioned about his role in kind of, you know, choosing the returners or maybe suggesting the returners based off of who he trusts. So could you just kind of um, unpack for us how those returners um, are chosen among the staff? Yeah, and that's the biggest word right there is trust. Why? Because they're in possession of the team's football. And so uh, that's first and foremost, whether it's on kickoff return or punt return, it must be first and 10 Aztecs at the result of the play or the Aztec PAT team coming out to kick the point after. So um, you want definitely the guys that have that ability to take it to the house, but most important is possession of the football. So it's guys that always catch and field the ball. And then the second most uh, critical up there with possession is communication. Guys that can communicate that the ball is on the ground, or I'm not going to be able to field this and be able to get the punt return team guys away from the ball, but they're good decision makers. They're articulate and possession of the football. So more competition. Um, you, you, the Aztecs have a history of using different snappers uh, based off of, you know, just different roles. Um, Jacob Rab was the field goal kicker or field goal snapper last year. Ryan Wittenmeyer, he, he did the punts. Um, Parker Houston did the field goals years ago, things of that nature. Do, do you anticipate having those roles separated um, or, you know, do you think Ryan or Tyson can, um, you know, win both of them? Yeah, I believe both of them uh, bring uh, great quality in both regards and why that you have different on field goal. It's about a 1.3 to 1.5 second play. And obviously it's a shorter distance snap, but body size does matter. Uh, Ryan as a freshman incoming freshman, he played in the season at about 205 pounds. um, Whereas Rab was right around 240 to 
250, 230 to 250 in that ballpark. So he had a much wider shoulders, a bigger stout presence. And just with his stance alone, it helps the field goal protection. Um, now that Ryan's got a full year of Coach Hall and our, um, our uh, meal plan, he's now gained the freshman 15 no problem. So uh, he's added some weight, and which was a concern of last year that will help him go towards earning the starting role because his snaps weren't the issue. It was just sheer size um, really stresses the guards, the adjacent players to him. So that was the thing that that really helped Rab win the job um, because both were very excellent snappers. And then with Chavez, he's He's already 240 pounds. I mean, he is a big young man, 6'3", and um, he rips it back there too. So both jobs are open. Uh, Ryan does hold the experience factor in starting in every game last year and doing a phenomenal job um, that that Chavez really has to be above and beyond. Um, But Ryan knows if he's not cutting it, you know, then – Here comes Chavez. So love the dynamic between both of them. Um, And I believe that Wintermeyer will be in a better standing to earn the field goal job, uh, snapping duties this year uh, and taking care of his body and and obviously just naturally growing up a year older, a year stronger and, and eating a heck of a lot better. That's interesting. I had never thought of it from that perspective of just the center having size. So it's a, Learn something new every day. <laughs> and one of the um, rules that was implemented is that you can't align on the snapper anymore. So that helps yeah. for an undersized guy. However, a slighter guy now makes the A gaps. You know, now the whole formation is now more condensed because you have a smaller stature field goal snapper. So those are a couple of things that go into it. But um, uh, Ryan's doing everything in his power to now earn those jobs and, and checking those boxes. We've we've talked a lot about the the snappers, the kickers, and the returners, but there is you know nine, ten other guys on the field for special teams that play just as important of a role. Um, could you break down how you decide which players get to get those positions? Uh, and then starting with kickoff return, what do you look for when you got people on the inside and then on the outside? Those are great questions. How much time do we have? <laughs> you tell much us. As you need. Much as you yeah, need. There, there's. Um, with the first question in terms of, you know, like what you're looking for, like how are they earned? And and that's going to come down to fall camp, spring ball. And then for the incoming guys, and certainly for the guys from spring ball, because that kind of sets your pre- preliminary fall camp depth chart. Um, it's, it's fall camp drill work, which guys mm-hmm. move really well. And then I get the advantage of watching them play their offense and defensive position and you see how they compete and those all of those skills that they play and utilize the techniques in their position group translate to special teams blocking in space uh, tackling um, those sort of things so they give you a good idea already of what they can do and then on my part and the staff's part is plugging those guys into roles that they can have success. On the kickoff return, there's a couple different uh, components to it. On the front line, so the guys that are closest to the ball, you want guys that are alert. One, they got to be able to feel the ball as soon as it's bun on side for 10 yards. It's our ball, and that you got to have the gusto to go after it because you got no lead blockers to go get it. Uh, the mm-hmm. seconds, they got to cover the most ground. They've got to retreat or drop back, um, and then to be able to get set up and then get onto their blocking assignment and sustain the block. So you're going to see a lot more uh, wide receivers, uh, even defensive backs um, and and some linebackers that can move well in space. And then when you start going towards the back end on the kickoff return team, so guys that are not on the front line, uh, they tend to be a little, you want guys that are a little more stout stature wise and weight wise. They pack a punch because now they're taking on, kickoff team members that have gotten a 40 to 50 yard running head start. And now they've got to create some momentum uh, towards and then sustain contact as well. So you're going to start seeing a little bit more tight ends, linebackers, athletic defensive linemen in those back end kickoff return. And then your returners again, back to the point or the question we had before this one possession of the football, they have to be able to field it out of the air, uh, know how to fair catch, feel confident about catching the ball and then, and great communicators. 
What about on the punt return? Is Do you value someone that could rush the punter more than someone that could block and set up the punt return? There is, uh, you want the unicorn. You want the guy that can has an explosive get off that is a factor in getting to the block point. And then you love the guys that are great at getting on guys, meaning they come off the ball and they, they engage the punt team player guy and they refuse to let that guy go tackle or make the returner fair catch. So you want a blend of both. What gets uh, noticed really quick through the drill work is whether they have a great get off. We do the block circuit and, and you can identify real quick which guys have a knack for it, such as Trenton Thompson, Kagan Williams, um, and the guys that are, are just they blow it out. They, they do a great job on on the hold up portion of it. And you kind of have a blend of both. And so you try to put the best guys out there, the best 10 other than the returner um, that give you the blend of both. And if, quite frankly, you don't have guys that are really explosive, get off and have a knack for getting to the block point, then you're going to be much more of a return team. Um, but when you have guys that do show they can know how to get to the block point and are just so gifted in, in athleticism and speed, then you're, it's more likely you'll see more rush attempts where you are uh, pressuring the block point. This is absolutely terrific. Um, very, very educational, insightful. Thank you. Um, what, but keeping it going, man, what, what about punk coverage? Um, switching it around now. Uh, what, what is it that you're looking for? You want guys that are are um, accountable. First and foremost is protection. So they got to be sound in knowing who they're blocking and then having no hesitation about it. Their first steps right into contact and then they are able to run. On the punt team, you've got to be able to, to run downfield, defeat a blocker, the guy that's holding you up. You got to be aggressive and then you got to have a nose for the football. So you like guys that are defensive guys have an advantage because they're open field tackling throughout the course of their career, let alone every day at practice. Um, but the offensive guys such as Jordan Bird, Kagan Williams, uh, Jalen Armstead uh, would rotate in on the punt team last year. Those are the running back position, um, but they, they, checked every one of those boxes because they were aggressive when they were at the scene where the ball was in the returner's hands, they took their shot and they, they would land it. And quite frankly, if they didn't, it, it, it just bounced right to their next teammate uh, and had everything to do with our success uh, last season on the punt team. So looking for guys that are aggressive, uh, guys that are accountable, know what to do in terms of how to protect the block point and that guys that can go down the field and, and when the ball's there, they go take their shot. Last one, then what about kickoff coverage? Kickoff coverage, boy, did that that was a conditioning last year. Matt uh, blasted over 60 touchbacks, so they were sprinting through the end line more often than not. Uh, but that's a, a big carryover to punt. Uh, guys that are on kickoff are guys that can run because this is a dead sprint where punt, you got a guy, you know, getting on you at the line of scrimmage while on kickoff. You got to be able to avoid guys that are early blockers on you and do it with speed, not breaking down, flying down the field with your hair on fire. And you want 11 guys that want to go introduce their face mask uh, to the torso of the returner. So that's who we're looking for on kickoff, at least. And uh, excited to see uh, who who earns the, the 11 positions this year. Speaking of kickoffs, is that a competition that needs to wait and be decided until you've got the punter and field goal kicker decided because it would have to be one of those two being the kickoff guy? That will uh, tip its hand as we get into fall camp. First thing we look for is guys that can hit a touchback because that's your best defense, right? A non-return. And they 100% get the ball at the 25-yard line. If we have an issue to where we are not consistently hitting the ball five or more deep in the end zone, now the competition piece comes in. And if two guys are neck and neck and their chart says they hit it to the goal line every single time, that may be a consideration if he's also doing the punt duties and the kickoff. If there's another kickoff guy that's doing the exact same production as the guy that has the punt duties or the field goal duties. Um, so that will kind of play out as we get into fall camp here and, and be under consideration for the entirety of the season too. Uh, as we, as we talked about all of last year with Matt and, and keeping a kick count and making sure that the fatigue factor, which is inevitable um, is limited as possible. Special teams 
is is one of the best way that freshmen can find their way onto the field potentially. Um, how do you go about identifying which freshmen can be part of that uh, special teams uh, competition? That's a great question. And that's one that I love every year because they really show themselves on the field and on film. Man, who is that? When anytime I sit and watch the practice film after I'm out on the field, um, that gives me a great indication that he's got all the athleticism to play right now. And then what's really great uh, for the game is that the red, sh red shirt rule uh, now allows you to play four games. So I'll give you an example of one back in 2019, Garrett Fountain. Uh, here's this six, five, you know, linebacker that can run really well. He's super aggressive. You know, he doesn't hesitate, all those good things. But as we got out there and he played in three games, you could tell that when guys did engage him, he wasn't strong enough yet to get off of guys as well as you hoped and as well as he hoped. And it was one of those things we brought him. I brought him into the office and said, I think you're a year away from being really great at, at, at playing this game and especially helping us on special teams. And he was playing on kickoff. And again, most of the reps are touchback. So it was a decision whether, you know, he keeps playing on kickoff and, and burn, burn a year of eligibility where he wasn't on the other teams. He wasn't in the linebacker depth on game day um, that we didn't have to use him. And now he's really blossomed. He's one of our top performers on special teams. Uh, he's got a much more, he's more physically ready. And so what you're looking for in camp in this roundabout answer I'm giving to you is, is guys that are athletic enough to do it and they'll flash, they'll show through all the drill work and they're going against veteran guys and, and holding their own. You go, okay, he's got a shot at playing. And from there, then it's the team reps. Can he do that verse 11 on 11? Does he have an idea of the concept of the play, what we're trying to do and does he do it? And if he does, he's playing. It doesn't matter if you're a senior or a freshman scholarship walk on, if you can do those things, then you're playing. So you're exactly right. Special teams usually is uh, most guys first action and they, they really show that in fall camp. It's pretty evident. And then from there, our job and my job and coaching them is that they, they have a great understanding of what they're doing because clearly they don't have experience yet. And it goes much faster on Saturdays than what we can simulate at practice. So those are the fun things about the job and that I really love and anticipate a really good competition because I'm excited to see what the newcomers uh, bring to the table. Last couple of questions for us. Um, you know, in the NFL, there's guys who are special teams players, guys who cover kicks, guys who return them. I mean, San Diego State has a long history. Heath Farwell, Kasim Osgood, Calvin Munson, um, players that you, that, you know, NFL fans of those teams know who they are because of how critical of a role that they play. But what are, what are some names of some um, Aztecs who um, maybe not starting, maybe not, uh, you know, household names, but they are so critical to um, all of these roles that we've been asking about? Yeah, uh, there's a ton. Uh, I'd be remiss if I leave guys out there um, because, as David said, you know, thank you to the photographer. How you guys cover us, how you guys um, uh, publicize our players, it, it's much appreciated, and the guys uh, love it. And so I, as the coach here, I do not want to be in a position where I'm saying, oh, these guys are the unsung heroes that may not be in the two deep that are playing, and, and they know who they are. So I'll give you a few, though. Um, that, that come to mind, a guy like Jay Rudolph. Now he's, he's taking more reps at tight end now with Dan Bellinger, you know, uh, going on to the giants. And uh, he's been one of those stud guys on special teams. Uh, gosh, Vi Cajo, uh, just a guy that runs through a brick wall. He hasn't, you know, really solidified himself in the top three in the linebacker room. He's working to be in the top six, so he'll get some playing time, but he's really made a difference on special teams. You got a guy like Kyron White, you know, he, he doesn't break into that Aztec position because Pat McMorris has played really well, um, but he'll rotate in at Aztec, but he's noticed on special teams. Uh, he's Jersey 19 for all our Aztec nation out there. Uh, CJ Bashville before he took over, you know, the warrior position here at the end of this uh, season or midway through the season here, he was another prominent, here was a freshman playing on special teams because he, he flashed in fall camp and he just got better and better. The more and more experience he got and was a fun one to see. Um, again, I, I I'll go through how much time do we have? Cause there, there's a ton um, that really do a great job. Um, Dan Apoco, 
Um, you know, you got a star studded D line room and, and he's working to break into the two deep and get more reps on D line. He did a great job on the shield on punt. Um, that was critical. Same with Wyatt Drager. Um, so a ton. Um, my last one I'll give you is Isaiah McElvain. Doesn't break in in the, in the secondary uh, playing corner and safety for us. I mean, he'll do anything to get on the field. And that's evident to me when I watch him on film. Uh, did a great job covering on punt. You did a great job covering on kickoff. Um, was on punt return, shutting down the number one or the gunner, the widest player on the opponent punt team. So that, that's just a few. I, and I apologize to the rest of the guys that I've left off here, but for sake of time um though they make they all make the difference they may not be the one or two deep on offense or defense respectively but they're they're big time point getters in in special teams in our grading of them and uh have everything to do with us winning 12 games that's great that uh everyone appreciates it because that's one of these village times like main goals is to bring to light the entire roster um but last question, when Peco Park was built, um, a lot was made about how the ball didn't travel because of the marine layer locations, et cetera. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I, if I remember right, Qualcomm Stadium, it was better to kick to the east than to the west. Um, and I'm not exactly sure. That, you know, there was definitely a preference. And um, has there been, do you have any idea, because they're going to ask you, you know, which side of the field should we be kicking to of how Snapdragon is going to play, how the, all the conditions are going to make for kicking in, in the Aztecs new home? That is a great question. And I won't know until we scrimmage there uh, this August. A um, couple factors though, that I do know, or I certainly noticed when we got to tour it, different from SDCCU, Qualcomm, uh, it is not fully enclosed. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the second and third tier, um, the bowl um, would really help block out a lot of the wind, quite honestly. And you would notice when the, when the garage door, and I don't, when you said East and West, because Qualcomm kind of sat there where the band would come in on to the field, that garage door behind one of the goalposts, when that was open pregame, the wind gust would fly right through there and would definitely affect field goal or kickoff going that direction. Well, with Snapdragon, with banked um, tiered seating on each side, the West and the East side there, I'm going to say there may be a wind tunnel. If the wind comes off of one bank of those uh, seats and comes one direction, we will have to see. But I believe that wind will be, to answer your question, much more of a factor than it was um, at Qualcomm, Jack Murphy, SDCCU Stadium prior to this. Is that something you can replicate in on the practice field so that you knew you know how uh, the kickers would do in that environment, or is that you just have to get out there on, at Snapdragon and see it for yourself? Well, being on the Mesa, the practice field, we are elevated um, and we get yeah. pretty good. We get a decent win. We don't get these howling winds and no, you can't ever really replicate it. Um, to answer your question or things that we do to to best simulate it, if it is a side to side, uh, according to the field, you know, east to west wind, if the, the field's north and south, um, to kick in the wind. So kicking horizontally on the field. And in doing so, uh, that's when we really train our mechanics. When it is windy, you aren't going to use the same mechanics. For instance, on kickoff, you will not hang the ball up higher because it'll just get knocked down with a headwind. You know, you get a tailwind. Now you're really looking to drive the ball and just put it up and let the wind take it, you know, from there. When you're kicking into the wind, it, uh, let's talk punting. Your tendency to use a lower drop so you do drive the ball because, again, if you use your normal and hang the ball up, now it's liable, again, just like on kickoff, to get caught and knocked down and plummet straight back uh, to the line of scrimmage. So technique changes, and the best way we try and simulate that is when we do get wind um, at practice is that you kick into it, kick, you know, kick it with it at your back, um, and if it is using the width of the field, you do it based on where the wind's blowing, but those are definitely things we cover and, and rep during the week and during fall camp. When we do have those situations, what will we do? 
Interesting. Coach, uh, we want to, we appreciate your time. We definitely want to thank you for giving us an in-depth look at the special teams units and heading into fall camp. And we look forward to see uh, who wins some of those competitions. Great. Look forward to it too. Thanks for the coverage and uh, go Aztecs. Hope you guys enjoyed our conversation with uh, Coach Doug Deacon, uh, special teams coordinator at San Diego State as he gave us uh, a great insight into how the special teams unit is looking as they head into fall camp that starts on August 5th, just a few days away. Um, and we're almost a month away from opening game at Snapdragon Stadium, September 3rd, 1230 p.m. on CBS against Pac-12 Arizona Wildcats. Thank you guys for listening. Make sure to subscribe. Uh, to the podcast on any platform that you prefer so you get notified when new episodes arrive and we'll talk to you guys next time thank you for listening you are listening to the sdsu football podcast presented by the east village times with your hosts andre hagverdian and paul garrison